I mean, I am vain, but people don't need to know that. So we need to have a couple of quick announcements for you. So um, I've noticed over the past couple of weeks that people are having trouble getting the forums done on time. And I'm not trying to make that difficult for you. I added this this year because I thought it would be fun for us. Um, but it seems like people are struggling to get them in. So I wanted us to decide as a class what deadline would be better for people because Friday at five seems like it's a little bit too tight for people. Does anybody have any suggestions on a time that would work? Okay, I see hands. Tessa. Um, so before I give my suggestion, would you rather it be on a weekday as opposed to a week? I don't care. I don't care. Like I can I can grade from my phone. I can grade pretty much anywhere. So mm -hmm. it's it's really not about me. It's about what's more convenient for y'all. I saw Danny's hand and then Story's hand. Uh, Friday night into Saturday, midnight, Friday, Saturday. Okay. Uh, Okay. Okay. How about you, Story? We just need to have maybe just make it a little bit later. Would that be okay if we made it a little bit later? How late are how late are we wanting? Okay. Nine o'clock. Would anybody say eleven? Okay. Huh? Midnight, you want mid okay. So the thing is it can't do midnight. 11, it can't do eleven fifty-nine. It's gonna have to be eleven fifty-five. Is that is that reasonable? Yeah. Okay. Um, because I've noticed a couple people keep missing it and it's the same people, and it's not a big deal when it's only two. That's 10 points. But Eventually, it's going to start adding up the more you miss, and I'm starting to notice a problem, and I want to tackle it. Now, because I did give an extension for number two, I'm going to go ahead and open up an extension to number one as well. So if you missed it, you've got an opportunity to take care of it. However, this deadline is set. If you miss it, you miss it. Is that okay? Yeah. Nine at five, right? Huh? Nine at five. Uh, it was today at five. But I'm good, but we need that for the first forum as well. So do you want me to push them to Friday as well? So you get all three of them done by Friday. Would that be okay? Yes. Is that okay? Are there any objections? Speak now, please. Trying to be Thank good you. here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just when I start noticing patterns, and I'm not afraid to put like go against something. Um that I set, like there's a reason that my syllabus says tentative, tentative, because things can be changed. Now, please don't ask me to push back exams <laughs> unless we absolutely have to. That's going to be a call that I am going to make. Uh, speaking of which, I have a couple of other announcements for you. So I know you won't believe it, but our first exam is actually coming up in two weeks. So if you require use of the testing center, if you need time and a half or two times, so if you have to use the Coldery Center to take that test, please get the forms to me by next Monday. And I will tell you why I said next Monday. So get them to me sooner rather than later if you need accommodations. Um, so here's what's gonna happen. It's definitely gonna cover chapter one, definitely going to cover chapter two and it's going to cover part of chapter three so we will basically include on the test whatever we make to chapter three but chapter one and chapter two will definitely be on there next week i will be giving you a study guide so it will have all of the things that you should probably study for and look back on and i'll give you a heads up on the short answer questions now i'm not going to be specific but I'm going to say, maybe you should know about this, this area or this area. And the night before the test, I will be doing a review session here in the student lounge. If you can't make it, a friend is more than welcome to record it for you. Yeah. What time? It's probably going to be on the 20th, so the day before the exam. So Tuesday, the 20th, it'll probably be around 6 or 7. If you cannot make it, a friend is able to record that for you. I am totally cool with that. 
Yes. So that the third form would have been Friday. Yes, but we're going to push all of those deadlines to 1155. Okay. And if you miss those first two, you miss those first two. Just move on. We will have bonus questions on exams where you can get extra points. We will have some extra credit opportunities. So if you miss it, I know it hurts to miss things, but we will have opportunities occasionally to make up what you missed. Yes. How long do you want five responses to be? Oh, so as long as you need them to be. Okay. As long as you need them to be, please don't make it a doctoral dissertation. I already wrote one and had to read mine. So <laughs> I don't want to read anybody else's. All right. So one other announcement that I had. So you'll notice that I said, if you require accommodations that you need to get your form to me by Monday, here is why. On Wednesday, you are not having class. You are going to be watching a pre-recorded lecture that I am going to make for you. I'm going to be in Columbia finding out if I have autism spectrum disorder or not. Um, and so uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> This is always nice. It, it, it would help make sense of a lot of things, but at the very least, it will give me coping mechanisms regardless. Like, what do I do when I'm in the mall and there's too many people and I don't like it? <laughs> I hate crowded areas. I also hate when you go into Ulta and they ask you if you need help like three oh, times within five yeah, minutes because I, I get nervous and I'm like, what, do you think I'm a thief? That's exactly what a thief says. <laughs> and I know it. Um, but I'm not gonna be here. So here's the deal. The appointment is at 1030. I'm gonna be three hours away. And, and I get done at 1130. So I'm gonna drive all the way back. I will be back on campus around three o'clock if you need me. So if you do need to get those forms to me, I will be in my office the 14th, three o'clock in the afternoon until five. If you need accommodations, just know I'm going to pre-record a lecture. I'm going to make that available to you Monday afternoon or Monday evening. You can watch that in lieu of coming to class. What day is that again? Wednesday the 14th. So that's a week before the exam. Does that sound okay? I wanted to make y'all aware of it because that wasn't, I didn't know when this appointment was going to be. So I was like, well, we're just gonna have to roll with it until I find out. Cause technically I took all of the fun IQ test stuff back in July. I was so bad at some things. <laughs> all right, who's ready to talk about the brain? Yeah. I need a little more enthusiasm than that. Come on, there we go. Thank you, thank you. Now, now, now. All right, so the last time that we were here, we were starting to talk about neurons and their electrical properties. So one of the things that we know is that these electrical properties happen because of flow of ions, which are charged particles across the membrane. So here's what's really interesting. The outside of a cell of our neuron is more positive than the inside of our cell. So there's a really special term that we use for this. It means that it's polarized. So polarized means that we've got a difference in charges. So the inside is negative, the outside is positive. So here's what we know. And I'm gonna to try to keep this really short because we go into this in depth in biopsych. And if you're interested in taking that next semester, you're thinking about a bio major or an HBS major, I would highly, did you lose something? <laughs> I forgot my glasses. No, I give you mine, but they're the prescription is awful, and then I wouldn't be able to see. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you want to? Oh, but they want to sit with their friends. Oh, you can sit together. Okay, okay, all right. So, so here's what we know, and you don't need to write this down. Um, so in general, what we know is that areas that have more ion concentration, they want to move to an area that has less. So how many of you have sprayed perfume, like a lot of perfume? 
you know, somebody that wears a lot of perfume um, and they spray it all over and you're like six feet away. And then all you don't smell it at first, but all of a sudden you can. This is because of something known as diffusion. So areas where molecules have a very high concentration, they want to move to an area where there's low concentration. So we've got all of this sodium outside of the cell that wants to diffuse inward because there's very little sodium there. It wants to spread out evenly. Additionally, we know that sodium is positively charged. The inside of the cell is negatively charged different charges attract each other. The problem is, so that really wants to drive sodium inside of the cell. But as I mentioned, at rest, the channels that would normally let sodium inside are blocked. They are not open. They're basically like a bouncer at a club. And so at rest, we have this negative charge. This channel for sodium, so sodium will only enter the cell if the cell has been stimulated enough to actually reach a threshold of about negative 50 millivolts. So it'll become a little less negative. And at that point, the sodium channels will open and sodium will rush inside of the cell. So once this happens, this difference in charges, what we find is that because sodium rushes inside of the cell, the actual voltage of the neuron shifts from negative all the way over to positive for a very short period of time. And that change in charge is going to travel all the way down the axon. And that, that is an electrical signal. Now, you'll kind of notice this, you have two neurons communicating with each other. Now, here's what's really critical. This picture makes it look like they're touching, but if we look a little closer, they're not touching at all. There's a tiny little gap. This gap is called a synapse or a synapse. I call it a synapse. And molecules of neurotransmitter will be released onto the receiving neuron. So this is how the message gets transmitted. It's gonna travel down the axon to the end of the neuron. The neuron is going to release neurotransmitters onto, into the synapse that will be picked up by the receiving neuron and that's called reception. So you have all of these little neurons making contact with the receiving neuron. At that point, that receiving neuron is going to basically calculate all of the different messages it gets. So we kind of talked about this on Friday. We've got our party animals, the people that want the neuron to fire, and we've got the party poopers, the people that want the neuron to not fire. The basic idea here is that it's going to calculate how many party animals there are, so how many excitatory messages do we have versus how many party poopers we have? So those inhibitory messages. What we find is that if there's more excitatory messages than inhibitory messages, that neuron will reach threshold and an action potential will begin again. So I would love to tell you that this is water. It is technically water, but there is a mix-in. The mix-in is clear, but it tastes like berries. It's very weird. I also don't drink clean water. <laughs> so one of the things that we know is that an act as, oh, did you need me to go back? Yes. Oh, no worries. I know I talk fast. I get excited about brain things. I think we're good. Okay. So one of the things that we know is that as long as a neuron reaches that threshold, an action potential will actually happen. And here's what's kind of wild about an action potential. This change in voltage is referred to, basically it happens in an all or none way. So that means as long as you hit threshold, the action potential will always occur. Here's what else we know. It doesn't matter how intense the stimulation is. If it's enough to trigger an action potential, the action potential will always happen the same way. So here's an example. And I 
I know it's not the most wonderful of examples, but it works. We're gonna use an example of flushing a toilet. Okay, so bear with me here. So how many of you have flushed a toilet and you didn't flush the plunger hard enough? And what happens? It kind of starts a little bit, but then it stops. So this is what kind of happens when the neuron is stimulated a little bit, but not enough to reach threshold. So it kind of tries to start, but because it's not enough to reach threshold, it's eventually gonna stop. That's like if you flushed a toilet, but you didn't hit the plunger hard enough. Now, as long as you hit the plunger hard enough, the toilet will flush. Now, here's what's really important. If I karate chop the toilet plunger, is that gonna change how the toilet flushes? No, if I kick it with my foot, as long as it flushes, it's going to flush the same way. It doesn't matter how hard I push the handle. So how hard it flushes doesn't change based on how hard the stimulation is. So here's my point. If that's enough to trigger an action potential and that, which was harder, is hard enough to trigger an action potential, the action potential still looks the same regardless of intensity. Kind of cool. So it's either going to fire or it won't. As long as it hits threshold, it will. If it doesn't hit threshold, it won't. And this does not vary based on intensity. It's always the same. And here's what's really cool, folks. So what we find is that you get that depolarization that I mentioned. So it's going to become less negative. It's going to shift to positive. Then Eventually, those sodium channels are going to close. The cell is going to become more negative, and we're briefly going to enter what is called a refractory period. During this period of time, the neuron will either not fire at all, no matter what, or you're going to need slightly stronger stimulation. Now, to put this into perspective, all of this happens in about five milliseconds. That basically means that you can have about 20 of these in one tenth of a second. You can have about 200 of these in a second. So this happens pretty quickly. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. I'm gonna take a sip of water just in case anybody, anybody needs more time. That's cool, I was waiting. Okay. All right. So I know you're excited about this. And I remember on Friday, people had questions about neurotransmitters. So we are going to talk about these here. So when the action potential happens, it travels all the way down the axon. And then neurotransmitters are going to be sent into the synapse. Now you've heard me talk about a sending neuron and a receiving neuron, we have special terms for those neurons. So our sending neuron is sometimes referred to as a presynaptic neuron. Our receiving neuron is sometimes referred to as a postsynaptic neuron. So we have our presynaptic neuron, here's our synapse, and here's our postsynaptic neuron. So the neuron is going to send messages to those postsynaptic neurons. So here's what's kind of interesting. For those of you who don't know, uh, I teach a class in drugs and behavior. 
Um, I am actually going to be teaching that next fall. So we talk about different types of drugs and how they affect the body and how they affect the brain. And uh, one of the things that when I first taught the class, I spent the first half of the class talking about neurotransmitters and people really didn't like that. Mm -hmm. I think in my eval, I got somebody going, this class is drugs and behavior, not neurotransmitters and behavior. And they're not wrong. And well, I don't want to, I don't want to judge. I don't want to judge. That's not my place. I do spend, a, I did spend a little too much time talking about the neurotransmitters. I spend about two weeks now rather than like seven, but you have to know about neurotransmitters because that's how drugs work. Drugs work on the basis of these neurotransmitters. And it turns out that research on different types of drugs have helped us understand neurotransmitters better. So one of the things that we know is that drugs are either going to enhance certain transmitters or they are going to inhibit certain neurotransmitters. So when we say that a drug enhances the effect of a neurotransmitter, we call that an agonist. If a drug inhibits the effect of a neurotransmitter, we call that an antagonist. So here's a couple of examples. So we have something like heroin. Heroin is an agonist of endorphins, which are our body's own endogenous opioids. You and I make your own pain relievers. Um, and so drugs like heroin and Oxycontin and Vicodin all enhance the effect that endorphins have on the body and they enhance endorphin release. On the other hand, how many of you are familiar with Botox? How many of you have heard of Botox? And what does Botox do? Yeah, Danny. Uh, kind of. What? It's not nerves as much as it is. It, it hurts muscle contraction. So a telltale sign that somebody might have had Botox in their forehead is that they can't really move their eyebrows. Their forehead stays really smooth. Um, now, the reason that that happens is because Botox blocks muscle contraction. It's an antagonist to a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is critical for muscle contraction. So when I flex my bicep like this, every time I flex my bicep, acetylcholine is being released in my muscles so that they can contract. When you inhibit acetylcholine, the muscles can't contract and you get this nice flaccid paralysis where nothing moves. I mean, it's not nice. You can die, but generally Botox won't do that. Botulism will. If your cans are bulging, do not, dr do not eat from it. Do not drink from it. That probably has botulin botulism in it and it's one of the most dangerous natural substances. Okay. So when neurotransmitters are released onto the receiving neuron, they largely are gonna bind to very specific receptor sites. So if you have a molecule of serotonin or dopamine, you're going to have a very specific receptor site that specifically binds to only dopamine or only serotonin. So it kind of fits like a key fits a lock. Now, some drugs work the way that they do because they look like molecules of neurotransmitter. So for example, a lot of amphetamines, so things like Ritalin, things like speed, things like meth, all of them have a very similar molecular structure to dopamine. So they're gonna be able to bind to that site very, very easily. Yes. What's the neurotransmitter that you put like throughout the day that sleepy that caffeine swaps in? That would be a dentist sign. And we're not really going to talk about a dentist sign. We don't really actually know that much about a dentist sign besides the fact that it's involved in sleep wake behavior. So caffeine is a stimulant like other stimulants like nicotine, meth, cocaine, and the like, but it's different because it works on different neurotransmitters. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, well, I'll give you the basics. So, dopamine is what is referred to, and you don't need to write this down. This is just me flexing my knowledge a little bit and showing off. Um, so, dopamine is what is called a catecholamine. So dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine all come from the same molecular family, and we call them the catecholamines. Um, if you have taken OCHEM, or if you're thinking about taking OCHEM, I can't really help you with this. I just know it's called a catecholamine because it's made up of one amine group, and then it also has a catechol ring. And they all derive from the amino acid tyrosine, which is present in a lot of meats and proteins and things like that. And then uh, serotonin is actually also, and um, it's part of the amine neurotransmitters, but it's not a catecholamine because it does not have that catechol ring. It's what we call an indolamine, and it's derived from the, pro uh, the amino acid tryptophan which you've probably heard of. Tryptophan is basically present in a lot of protein-rich foods, dairy products, and stuff like that. So they have a similar chemical structure, but they're different classes and they're different families. Different yes, they do. <laughs> yeah, Danny. There's a lot of the drug names you're listing, um, vitamins such as, as um, they're addictive drugs. How do they determine whether neurotransmitters can be addictive? Well, neurotransmitters can't really be addictive, but drugs can be. Um, but I get your point. Um, trying to think. So usually it comes from research that we've done with animals. Um, so one of the things that we do is we give an animal a drug and we see if they will self-administer. So if they like it, they're going to press a bar so they can get more of a drug. So shockingly enough, do you know what the most reinforcing drug is to rats? It's cocaine. The problem and cocaine is really reinforcing. The problem is the side effects are awful. That's why you don't really find a lot of people who are addicted to cocaine because it's really reinforcing, but it's unpleasant. Um, in the case of things like opioids, we do know that they are very reinforcing. Animals will self-administer to a stable blood point. We also know that they're addictive because they are very physically addictive and the withdrawal symptoms that are produced will often keep people using just to avoid the painful withdrawal. So it's, it's a little bit of, we know this from animal research, and we also know that they have strong physical dependencies. And it's not just heroin that does that. Alcohol is like that as well. The withdrawal symptoms can be very deadly. So people keep taking that drug to avoid the withdrawal symptoms. So here, you don't need to write this down. If you'd like to take a picture of it, that is totally fine. This is just showing you examples of how agonists and antagonists work. So here is our neurotransmitter molecule. Here is our receptor site. You can see that the agonist looks very similar. So this drug looks similar enough in its chemical structure that it can bind to that neurotransmitter site. Um, now, an antagonist also has a similar structure, but it's going to block other neurotransmitters from binding. Um, so, for example, this is a molecule of Carare. Carare is another um, type of drug that blocks acetylcholine. So in this particular case, um, Carare paralyzes victims by blocking acetylcholine. So again, you're going to get that uh, flaccid paralysis where the muscles will not be able to contract. You will actually stop breathing if given Carare because the muscles in your diaphragm that enable you to take a breath are not able to work. So you will basically die by suffocation because you can't breathe. I uh, know. Actually, here's what's really wild about Carare, and I'm going to keep it short because we have to keep pressing on. Um, 
The reason we know about Carare is somebody actually tested the effect of Carare on themselves. And if, the, if people had not been watching this researcher taking the Carare, he would have died due to suffocation for that very reason, because it was paralysis. They thought he was fine. Yeah. How did he not die? Like, how do you resolve that fast enough to make sure someone doesn't suffocate? Especially when you're just testing something on yourself and maybe weren't thinking about how to, you know, cure it or whatever. I... That's a really good question. I don't know, but I will look it up. I know if we were talking about the stopping breathing that happens with opioids, we have antagonists like Narcan, which will immediately uh, block the binding site because it binds more readily. Mm -hmm. And that will basically displace the uh, opioids like the heroin or the Oxycontin so that people can breathe again. Okay, so here's a couple of fun neurotransmitters and a little bit in what they're involved in. So we've already kind of talked about acetylcholine and its role in motor control and muscle contraction. Again, um, drugs like Botox basically block acetylcholine and prevent the muscles from contracting. Um, so acetylcholine is really critical for any motor movements that we make. Also, uh, when we're talking about our central nervous system, uh, attention and learning as well. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline, and they are basically part of that fight or flight response. They're going to give your body the energy it needs to deal with any stresses or challenges. Are breathing from different than? Huh? Are fawn and fawn different than fawn? It fawn is more of a long term trauma response. We're talking about short term behavior, but freezing could be a part of that response as well. So serotonin is often really critical for mood. It's also really critical for aggression. Now, you probably heard a lot of talk that depression is caused by not having enough serotonin in the body. And it turns out that it's much, much more complicated than that. Um, dopamine is really critical for things like motivation, our sense of reward, and it's also important for certain types of motor movements. Oftentimes, we're going to find that people that have Parkinson's disease, where they have difficulty making steady movements, often we find that they don't have enough dopamine being produced in certain areas of the brain. You also might have heard recently about things like dopamine fasts. The idea where you refrain from things that kind of give you a dopamine rush. So people will avoid eating certain foods, not checking social media, but really you should be trying to not get too overly involved on social media if you can possibly avoid it. Um, like not listening to your favorite music, possibly even refraining from sex. So all of these different things that give you pleasure, you try to avoid that. So to kind of reset your dopamine circuits. I don't really buy it. I don't really buy it, but I think sometimes if you need to take a step back from things like social media, it's not the worst idea in the world. I don't think it makes sense as a diet, but I don't it's not surprising that people would find benefit from taking a break from that constant stimulation. Oh, of course, of course. I just don't think it's, you know, exactly what they say it was. And then we have endorphins. So endorphins are really critical for our sense of reward, and they're also critical for pain reduction. So your body is capable of reducing pain. Now, it is technically a neurotransmitter, but unlike other neurotransmitters, in terms of its chemical structure, it's what's called a neuropeptide. It's very, very tiny.
How much smaller is it than other I don't know, but I can look it up. <laughs> Sometimes that's going to be the answer. I don't know, but I can look it up. I mean, if it's not important, then it's not important, then that's totally fine. But I also wonder how that affects its like uh, uptake and stuff. Um, it really doesn't. You have uh, opioid receptors all over your body, and those are going to be specifically sized for those particular um neurotransmitters so the size doesn't really matter here does that mean that the receptors are more densely packed or the places that it's recepted are just also smaller um it can be more densely packed there are definitely some areas where we find a very healthy and high amount of opioid receptors but they're not everywhere okay are y'all ready to talk about the brain already yeah. you're like i'm tired of neurons So I didn't realize a couple of you were following me on Instagram and I shared my Charlie the Unicorn story <laughs> yesterday. Do y'all even remember Charlie the Unicorn? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, I don't feel too old. I make Homestar Runner references and nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I will not be following back until <laughs> you're no longer in my class. How about that? <laughs> Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, because it makes it. Yeah, I did it because it makes the file sizes huge. So I was trying to cut down on file sizes. If you're wanting the pictures, taking a picture with your phone will help too. But I am sorry. I mostly take out the pictures because I wanted to cut down on the file size. Pictures just make the files that much bigger. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was deliberate. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be evil or anything like that. It's just, I know y'all have a lot of other things you might be storing on your computer. And if you're wanting to save those, I don't want to cut like storage space. Okay. So a long, long time ago, maybe about 200 years, give or take, we discovered that different parts of the brain are responsible for different things. This is known as functional specialization. So to give you an example and to kind of get a feel for this, go ahead and feel right here at the very back of your head, right where your head meets your neck. That is your occipital lobe. That area of your brain is entirely devoted to visual processing. You wanna talk about seeing color, seeing shapes, seeing visual motion or depth, it's all going to happen there. Um, so we know that different parts of the brain are for different things. However, back in the 1700s and the 1800s, we kind of took this functional specialization a little bit too far. Instead of being an air, instead of there being different areas for different mental processes, there were different areas for personality traits. So this is where we come to talking about phrenology. This was originally developed by Franz Joseph Gall and Johann Spurzheim. Um, how many of you are familiar with phrenology or have heard about phrenology? How many of you have seen cute little phrenology heads in the hippie stores? Yes, I only ever see them in hippie stores. I like hippie stores. They have pink Himalayan salt lamps. Um, but so here's the idea of phrenology. Every single one of you has unique personality traits. Yes. Yeah. You have things that you are good at. You have things that you are bad at. The, <laughs> you're bad at humility. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm the same way. I understand. No, I'm just <laughs> no, that was good. That was very good. Um, 
So the idea behind phrenology is that when you're high in a certain area and follow me, this is where it gets wild. There is a part of your brain that will bulge out and it will also cause there to be a bump in your skull. Apparently, according to phrenology, changes in the brain lead to changes in the skull. And that is not how that works. Does this mean that they sell the bones? Is it's actually multiple bones. <laughs> is this at a time where they did not understand that there is also space between the brain and the skull? Oh, they knew. Oh, no, they knew. They knew. They knew. There were medical schools back then. Okay. Yeah. They had, they could look at brains and stuff like that. No, they knew. But he, now here's the idea. So if you were high in something, you had a bulge in your brain for that area, and that would lead to a bulge in your skull. If you were deficient in a certain area, that would cause part of your brain to shrink and thus be an indentation of your skull. So the idea is if you feel around somebody's skull and look for the bumps and the indentations, you can get a personality profile of somebody. So for example, um, so for, well, but, but brain areas aren't tied to personality traits. So here's kind of the idea. Let's say I have a bump right here. You would have this map that would basically say you're high in loyalty, or you'd have a bump in this area and they'd be like, you're more likely to be a thief. <laughs> So yeah, we've got this emphasis on personality traits. And here's the part where it gets a little squeaky. A lot of the people who were really into phrenology were also really, really into eugenics. Ew, no. No. How does that hurt? Because it would just have to be like the surface parts. No, they'd be feeling around your skull and then they would match it to a phrenology head and they'd be like, you're high in this, you're low in this. You know, how does, how does that work for somebody like me? When I was a kid, my grandfather, my uncle, not my grandfather, my uncle was giving me a piggyback ride, dropped me. I've hit and busted my head open on a stone hearth. And now I've got a nice little indentation here. Does that mean that because my skull changed that I changed my brain and now I'm low in a certain area? That would imply this. Yeah. Also, this is pseudoscience. <laughs> This was like the 1800s. Yes. Did anyone try and like do body modifications in order to change their skull yeah. better? better? I'm wondering how exactly that would work. I don't think job that was. I, I would say that sounds a lot like self harm. And I'm hoping no, because if you want to change your skull, there's really only one way that you can do it. <laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> No brain, okay, no brain damage, no brain damage, let's not. Okay, now having said that, we laugh at phrenology and I encourage you, go look at some of these phrenology maps, they are ridiculous. But let's be very clear, your brain actually does have some functional specialization, but it's not about cutesy little things like personality traits. For example, what you're looking at here, so this is an area called, and you don't need to write this down, this is an area called the left inferior frontal gyrus. So that's this area right here. You are looking at the brain of a patient named Tan. Tan was a patient that was studied by Paul Broca, a French physician in the late 1800s. And basically Tan had had a stroke in this area. And here's what we know, y'all, blood kills brain cells. And once brain cells are damaged, they do not grow back. So this is the area that was damaged. You can see that that part is missing. Tan was able to understand language, but they were not able to speak. They were able to sing because singing's taken care of by a different area, but they were not capable of producing the motor movements necessary for speech. So we actually have a language production area in this area, the left inferior frontal gyrus, which is better known as Broca's area. So if this area is damaged, you can understand language, but you can't really speak it. 
So we do have some functional specialization. So immediately after class, because we've got like three minutes left, I am going to go change the deadline for all the forums and I will open them back up. Have fun. I think, so I will tell you that for forum number three, you do have to read a Wired article about a woman who had brain damage, but I think you're going to find it really interesting. You have to tell me one thing that you thought was interesting and one question that you had. Okay, we're not done yet. We got three minutes. <laughs> okay. So we're going to talk about this more on Friday. So we have our hindbrain. So we have three major divisions of the brain. So we have our hindbrain, which includes our brainstem, brainstem. You thought you forgot about that song, but I didn't. Um, so we have areas like our brainstem and our cerebellum. We have our midbrain, which we're going to talk about an area called the substantia nigra, which produces a lot of dopamine. And the reason that we call it that is because all of that dopamine production, it, when you open up the brain and you look at that area, it's actually black. It is the only part of our brain that is like that because of all of the dopamine that's produced there. And then we're going to talk about really the part of our brain that we tend to think of when we think of our brain, the forebrain. So we're going to talk about our subcortical structures, and we're going to talk about our cerebral cortex. We'll also talk about an area of the brain that uh, is responsible for a lot of different fighting behaviors and feeding behaviors. We'll talk about the weird visual areas. We're going to have a good time. I'm going to let you go ahead and get out a minute early because I know y'all were chomping at the bit. You were like, can we please go? Can we please go? All right, have a wonderful day. If you need me, I'll be in my office after class and later this afternoon. And you have a meet on Friday. I do. And then I also have a question. So I have this in my planner okay. for next week. Oh, and wait, wait, let me see. Do you, okay, wait. Let me turn this off first. Stop recording.